in is it possible to love life and see good days regardless of what others say about you or what others do to you? Not in our flesh. That's why we have got to be plugged into Jesus. That's why we have got to suffer like Jesus suffered. That's why Peter said, I want you to put aside, put aside all those hurtful, fleshly emotions and feelings and uh, be like Jesus. Now, he, in chapter 2, Peter painted with a really broad brush about everybody that you may come into contact with, the church, at work, government. Now, in chapter 3, he zeroes in like a laser on the family relationship. And this is when it gets hard because oftentimes we treat perfect strangers better than we do our own family. And he says, look at the verse, first part of chapter 3, in the same way. What does he mean, in the same way? He says, in the same way as what I've told you in chapter 2, how you interact with each other, with government officials, now in that same way, I want to take those same principles and I want you to bring them to your house and put them in your living room. And he starts with wives. And he tells them, wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one over to Christianity, to what you believe, without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now that's hard. Now there's some wonderful godly women in this church who I have such respect for because they have had to deal with the things that most women would have said, that's it, I'm leaving, here's your walking paper. But what he's saying is, be submissive. Now, he, he goes on to say to these women, I want your, your beauty, your adornment to be from your heart. I want it to reflect the love that you have in Jesus Christ. Now there, you know, he, he says, I want you to be chaste, and I want you to have respectful behavior. You know, we don't have any idea of what those words mean in our society anymore. We are just crude and um, just living. We are animals dressed in nicer clothes. Your adornment must not be merely external. He's saying it's not how you look on the outside. It's not how you dress. It's not how you do your hair. It's not jewelry. This isn't an opportunity to jump off in this verse and talk about what other uh, churches may believe about how women are to appear. But what Peter is saying is, it is your heart. You need to reflect the nature of Christ. Um, look at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way. The same way as what? The same way as he just talked to the women. The same way as he talked about to the church uh, in chapter 2 about here, here's how I want you to conduct yourself. But he says to the husbands, and, and I think this is very interesting, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. I think this is really interesting. His instruction to women is to be submissive, have a respectful Christ-like attitude, respect your husband. So what? So that if you have a husband who is not a believer through your behavior, he will come to know the gospel. That's a remarkable thing. But the instruction to husbands is the, risk, the consequences are different. He says to the husbands, again, look at verse 7, live with your wife in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. What? Why? 
so that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter is telling the men, you need to follow our behavior characteristics and follow the teachings of the scripture so that your prayer life, your relationship with your heavenly Father is good. Now, I know people think, oh, you know, Jeannie's going to go off on some feminist rag here, but, but I'm not. Uh, the younger Jeannie probably would have. What is going on in this church now, this great revival, is because men have stood up to say, I will live courageously for the sake of the gospel. I will be a Christian leader. And I thank God for this. That is why I believe we are seeing the growth. Does that mean that what the women did all those years didn't matter? Absolutely not. But you know, he tells us here, y'all are res to respect each other as fellow heirs. We are all the same in the eyes of Christ. He died for all of us. But we need to get back to the basics. We need to understand there are certain roles and with those roles are certain responsibilities. And men have been called to be godly leaders. And I thank God for the, the two guys in here tonight and for what we're seeing, the young men that we've got working in the back. This is a gift from God. This is great. We are to respect that with each other. Now, how do you make it through suffering? You know, because we're all going to suffer. And um, I want you to look at look at um, chapter eight. I mean, verse eight of chapter three. He gives us a clue here. He says, "To sum it up, in conclusion, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic." Show brotherly love, have a tender heart, and a humble mind. If you have these five characteristics, unity of mind, harmonious, harmoniously coexisting, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind, you're not going to have room for malice, deceit, hypocrisy, evil, and slander. That, that's just it in a nutshell. And when Peter says to sum it up, I, I would encourage you to mark your Bible because that's the key. We have to have unity of mind, and it's not my mind or Barry's mind or uh, Miss Juanita's mind. It is the mind of Christ. And if we have that, all of these other things will flow out of that because Christ showed sympathy, he showed love, he showed a tender heart and a humble mind. Again, if you look at the latter part of chapter 3, it again talks about Christ's suffering. Do you see these uh, cycles that we go through? The characteristics, the suffering of Christ. We suffer what our characteristics should be. So now, at the end of chapter 3, we're circling back around for a, a reminder of what Christ did for us. <coughs> and if you look at um, <coughs> verse 18, of chapter 3. For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. It is that sacrifice, that suffering, that brings us into the kingdom. And the example of Christ is his power he demonstrated at the resurrection. We have that same power in us. It's not anything we were born with physically, but it is a gift that we received of the Holy Spirit when we came to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That is the power that will fuel us if we tune into it to be able to love life and see good days even when we are suffering. So, to sum it up, for the rest of the week, 
And again, this is easier to do with work. And it's even easier to do it here at the church. But I mean, he's saying you need to do this at home. And I want you to think about this. Unity of mind. This is a harmonious, uh, peaceful existence. Sympathy. Brotherly love. Tender hearts. Humble minds. You know what? Peter writes, you know, it's not a big deal if you suffer because you did something stupid, you know, or you did something wrong. But if you're called to suffer for doing what is right, make sure how you handle it, you glorify Christ in all that you do. With that said, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to be like you, but it's just so hard because we listen to the world and we listen to Satan. Father God, help us tune Satan out. Help us focus on the resurrection power. Help us realize we must submit to you, Father. And if we do not do that, if we do not surrender this faulty concept we have of our independence, that we are going to struggle. We need to follow you, Lord. And we want to follow you. And we just ask, Lord, that you strengthen us and help us, Father God, in all that we do reflect you so that those in authority over us, those we don't like, those that have done us wrong, Lord, that they will see us acting differently. And through how we respond to them, the gospel will be proclaimed. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our conqueror. Amen. Hey, come on in. Uh, you know, we, weren't, we did not meet last Wednesday, and so if you got a handout, there are three pages, and I promise we're going to cover two chapters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you look at your um, the first page, true or false question? Chapter and verse divisions in the Bible are man-made. Amen. True. true or false? True. That's right. You cannot assume when you get to a new chapter that that may be a new line of thought or a new um, course that we're, we're being spoken uh, to. Remember we said if you ever see the word therefore, you look and it's, what is it therefore? Somebody needs the Holy Bible. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> um, you know, the last time we met, we talked about we had ten instructions from Peter, and they're on the first part of the uh, your page there to keep a sober spirit, fix your hope completely on grace, be holy in all your behavior, love one another. Number five is the springboard that we're going to jump off into today. Five is put aside evil dealings. What comes to your mind when you hear evil dealings? Child predators. Child predators. I, I have to tell you, I think of politics. Federal government. Federal government. Uh, meanness for those of us who work in the prison system. You know, it's uh, we've got their export of um, mm -hmm. evil dealings. Put aside. That, that's when, when you put aside something. What do you do? Yeah. You get it away from you, for lack of a better term. You know, you sometimes I'll get interrupted at work, and you know I put aside that one project and go work on another. And it's important when I put it aside that I don't get the files mixed up or confused. So you you separate it out in a way. Now, I am not even going to attempt to say the Greek word at the bottom. I'm glad not. <laughs> but. Um, it, it is the word that they translate put aside, and it occurs eight times. And it's, it's translated to put off, twice it's done that way, to lay aside, lay down, cast off, lay apart, to put off, aside, or away. So when Peter tells us to lay aside evil dealings, he's got some very specific things in mind that he wants us to put aside. And if you look at 1 Peter 2, 1, he tells us, therefore, therefore, 
you look up, what is it talking about? It's talking about um, how we've been born again, that once we, our physical bodies are, are perishable, one day they'll die, they're going to return to dust, but now they're imperishable. Im imperishable our spirit, we're going to live forever and ever in heaven with Christ if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. So he's saying because of that, because of God's grace and the gift of salvation, you need to put aside some things. First thing, malice. What is malice? You know, you may have heard the term malice of forethought. It's often used in uh, uh, the criminal it's definition of murder. It's hate, but it's more than hate. Malice really... Yeah. It's hate with feet and arms. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a vicious character. I can't think of anything any worse than when you see malice erupt in a church. You know, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's a vicious character. And churches aren't immune to this. Particularly in churches where we've really gotten away from the Word of God. So he tells, again, he, remember, who is he writing to in Peter? Christians. Christians. This is the letter. He's saying, put aside malice. Put aside your vicious character. The second thing, put aside deceit. What's, if someone is deceitful, what are they? Tricky. They're tricky. You know, another word is treachery. Um, Third thing, hypocrisy. If someone's a hypocrite, what's what's another way to think about that? They say one thing and do something. Right. Insincerity. You know, they um, two faced, three faced. Um, you know, they don't ins inspire you to believe in them. Envy. You know, I was doing all right until I got to him, and I'm thinking, now he's done quit preaching, and he's done gone to meddling. <laughs> when you're envious. You won't want somebody else like that. That's right. Um, you're, you're displeased at seeing someone else prosper. And then the last one is slander. When you slander somebody, what do you do? Cut them down. You cut them down, you lie. It is, uh, it's speaking evil. Of someone. Now, when you look at malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, and then you look at all the big, major, exciting crimes that are going on, it's coming out of these things. It's the heart. You know, what's in your heart is going to impact how you function out in the world. And keep in mind, Peter is writing to the church. And the church back then is not any different than the church today. We still have these things. And I think that the reason that Peter really spelled these out so clear, and I mean, he does not mince words. Put aside. Don't have anything to do with malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and surrender. Because these things, if they ever get into your congregation, what is it going to do to the testimony of the church? If these things get in your church, your church as a body of believers is not any different than a bunch of uh, hoodlums out on the street corner. Actually, I think it's worse. Because when you have identified yourself with Christ, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, it's, it's imperative that you identify with Christ. And these are not characteristics that we see reflected in how Jesus did. And if you will look down to, look at, look at verse 4. I'm going to read a couple of verses here, and I want you to look at and mark references to Jesus. We're going to start 
um, you know, he talks about, well, I'm just going to start at verse 1. Therefore, putting aside all malice, all deceit, remember he said all, all. There's no room for it, any at all. And hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the word, that is the scripture, the inspired word of God, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Now look at verse 4. When you, The version of the Bible that I'm reading from is going to refer to him, and this is Jesus Christ. Look at the descriptive phrases that describe Jesus. And coming to him, Jesus, as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also are what? Living stones. Are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through whom? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He tells us the first verse that I read there. Verse 4, Jesus is a choice cornerstone. The next verse, he says, and you are. Again, he's writing to believers. He is writing to us. You are a choice cornerstone. And we're being built up into a priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, keep that phrase, to offer up sacrifices, a spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, because we're going to go from this and we are going to jump into suffering. Because we don't think of our suffering as being any way, shape, or form as a spiritual sacrifice. I'm just going to tell you, I am allergic to suffering. I don't do it very well. And if I start suffering too long, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander, they are just right there with me, and I can have a really bad attitude. And it's because I don't remember that I have been called to be a choice living stone. We all have been. So, I want you to look at some words that I'm going to read starting in verse 7. Well, I'm going to start at 6. And again, listen to the phrases that describe Jesus Christ. For this is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Who is the him? Jesus Christ. This precious value, Jesus Christ, then is for you who believe our salvation. But he goes on to say, and listen to this comparison between those who believe and unbelievers, the saved versus the unsaved. The stone which the builders has rejected has become the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Those phrases Peter is using to describe what Jesus is to the unsaved. They do not like him. He is a stumbling block. You know, everybody, all the world, major world religions, everybody's okay talking about God. But when you start talking about Jesus, Oh, my stars. You know, I've had people say, how can you have uh, such a restrictive view? Yes, it's not me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. This scripture tells us Jesus is the choice living stone. It is through him that we receive the gift of grace and salvation, and we are to be like him. And the, for those who reject Jesus as being the cornerstone of our salvation, He's a stumbling block, and they're going to stumble right into hell. I, I'm sorry if you think that's a little harsh, but I get, you know, over the years, people, I, I get tickled. They say, we can't say that. That might hurt somebody's feelings. I said, well, do you think waking up your eternity in hell, they're not going to be a little upset over that? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the law. There is no other way. The scripture tells us that time and time again. Look at verse 9. 
And these are collective phrases written to the members of the church, but they also apply to us. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him, Jesus, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it's miraculous. He has called us into his grace, into salvation. Now, there, there are some um, more rules of behavior that Peter is going to give us here. And it's, what he's going to say is you, you're going to give to folks what you receive. You've been given the gift of grace through Jesus Christ. It is that same grace that you're going to give to others. Now, it's easy to extend that grace to y'all because y'all chose to come up here. We're church members. We're around each other all the time. We are of the same mind. We believe the same thing. But what Peter's saying is you need to extend this grace to everybody. Oh, now, Peter, surely you just. You want us to extend this to the uh, Romans who were actually ran us out of our home? Yes. Peter, you want us to extend this same grace to our masters that hold us into slavery? Yes. Now, to bring it up to us, 2011, oh, Peter, surely you don't mean for me to show this grace of Jesus to the inmates that I have to uh, hold security over. Oh, yeah. Peter, you don't understand. They'll take it as a sign of weakness. That's just the devil telling you that. Maybe where you work, it's somebody else. Somebody who, for no other reason, has been a shiver sent to run up your spine. You know, it's somebody you just, you have tried, you do not like them. It's not just you. No one else likes them either. Peter says, you are to show them the same grace that you received. And he goes on to say, government leaders, you are to show them the same grace that you received. You know, politics in this country has gotten so many. We love to sling labels on each other and just say horrible things. And You know, at work, uh, you, you learn there's some people you just don't even want to be around them when they start because... You just don't know where it's going to end. But Peter is saying, you show grace to them. And he's already told us, put aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Because if you are fully plugged into God's grace and you are living there, and you remember that you are a precious stone, you are a chosen race, you are a holy people, the more, the closer you live to Christ, the further away you are from malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander because those things do not exist in the persona of Jesus Christ. And just so that's clear, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander do not exist in the person of Jesus Christ. And he died for us and he is who we are to model ourselves after and to do. It's important that we get this. Now, there are some other things. That if you'll take your outline and then go back later this week and read verses 13 through 18, these are some of the things that Peter tells them to do. You are to submit and do what is right no matter how you feel about your circumstances or the people around you. And you're going to do it because your good deeds will glorify God. And by doing right, not being right, but by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, let me go over those again. Honor 
all people. All people include even those you don't like. Now, if somebody has uh, viciously attacked you or whatever, does that mean you just have to act like it's okay and it never happens? No. Absolutely not. You are to respect the person who the people. And, uh, and again, there are uh, several of us that work in corrections, some who have retired, and it's very easy to get into the mindset to degrade people and make them less than human. But we're not to do that. We are to honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Who's the brotherhood? Other Christians, your church family. See, this is why not only has Peter at the first said, I need you to put aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. That doesn't need to be in the brotherhood. Now he wants us to love each other. I think it is so interesting if you go to a church and it is obvious the congregation is warring. You know, the strife is there. What's that saying to the unsaved? You know, what they'll say is, hey, I've been to a bar. People are friendly down there. They're united. Everybody wants to drink. <laughs> y'all say y'all are children of God, and y'all are fighting over what color the pew pads are. We are to love the brotherhood. Fear God. If I had to pick one thing that I see so reflected in our society is we do not fear God. We've made him into uh, somewhat of a Santa Claus type, uh, granddaddy type figure. We don't fear him. And when we do not fear him, we devalue what is sacred. What does that mean, though, to fear him? I, it doesn't mean you're supposed to be scared of him. No, no. You know, it is, to me, it is the highest level of holy respect. And I guess to fear God is an acknowledgement to quote Mark, Trump, Mark Twain, there is one God and you ain't him. To fear God is, he is not human. He is not like us, only a whole lot better. He is God. He is Jehovah God. He is Yahweh. He is holy. And we need to get that in our heads. We need to respect the church family. We need to love each other. We don't let need to let things like, I wish they hadn't put that pot plant there. But that has no place in the brotherhood. And when I say the brotherhood, that is includes all of humanity. Um, and we are to honor the king. We are to honor our elected leaders. And we don't do this. And I tell you, I have heard some pretty caustic things come out of the mouths of, quote, religious leaders over our elected leaders. Now, I'm not jumping off into anybody's politics. That's not the point of this. But instead of criticizing our leaders, we should be praying for them. That's why politics has gotten so ugly in this country. And that's why we are in the mess we're in, because there is no honor. There is no respect. We have devalued everything. Peter goes on to say, you are to submit to both good and bad masters, employers, people. You don't get to pick. Oh, no one has had any more trouble with submission than me. I went to college at the height of uh, women's rights. And even as uh, a young person, hearing uh, all the theories and things that were coming out, I thought, you know, that's just not going to work. Uh, there are differences in men and women. And we have taken this term submit, and we have so politically charged it that, you know, you want to cause a division among women in a church or men. You know, it's been the most trumped on, <laughs> misconstrued, twisted up, turned around, and both sides have used it to say, I'm not going to submit to you, that's an Old Testament principle, and it doesn't apply to me, yada, 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 yada. And men use it to say, 
you got to submit to me, woman. And you know, it is, it is that attitude that produces malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. So, chapter 2 is, is a wide brush that Peter says to the church, this is how I want you to get along with each other, this is what you cannot have in your life, and this is what you need to do. And then he starts talking about suffering. It is, a, it is a spiritual sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus suffered. Without his suffering, I would not have salvation. My redemption would have not been possible, and neither would yours. But because of Christ's suffering, he was sinless, he was righteous, but he suffered. He took my sin, your sin, all the sin and suffered for it. And what Peter is saying, when you suffer, you need to suffer as the example of Christ. Who at the worst, when he was being so horribly abused, when he was being tortured up to his crucified, to, to his crucifixion, that was his physical body. That was his human body. You know, sometimes we think, oh, Son of God, maybe it didn't hurt. It hurt. He bled. He suffered. He died in human form. But what happened after that is spiritual. It is supernatural. And we have that same avenue of access into eternity because of what he did. When you suffer, and you treat it like a sacrifice, and you do it with the heart of Christ, it accomplishes something. Favor. If you look at verse 19, um, in chapter 2, it's talking about being submissive, uh, servants to their masters, uh, for this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God. A person bears up under sorrow when suffering unjustly. What that means is, if you have been right, if you are as innocent as the wind-driven snow, and you are suffering because somebody has unleashed malice, deceit, hypocrisy, evil slander on you, you have just been done wrong, if you suffer with your eyes on Jesus and your prayer is allow me to suffer like you did Christ you will find favor with God. Why? Because you're reflecting the nature of his son. Now, what is favor? Well, if you look not that I speak Greek or Hebrew because I don't, but I do have a software program on my computer <laughs> that I can do Bible research. The word favor is um, charis, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. It's the same word. We translate grace. Grace is unmerited favor. So when we suffer, and we suffer like Christ, we will receive grace. God's grace is sufficient to meet our every need. Now, there are lessons that we can learn um, by how Jesus suffered. And this is the lesson. That we, and keep in mind what we talked about, all of these human interactions between the church, government leaders, masters, employers, all of that. What Peter is saying is, in the big scheme of things, use Jesus as your example. The more he suffered, the more he trusted his heavenly Father. Knowing that his heavenly Father was in charge despite the circumstances around him, despite what he thought. And he knew that his heavenly Father would judge fairly and righteously. That's not how we do it. If we're suffering, by golly, we want judgment rain down, lightning bolts from heaven, and we want that person 
more than destroyed. That's not how Jesus did. And that's what Peter is saying. You suffer like Jesus did. Now, I know we're going fast. I'm going to get these two weeks um, caught up. Loving life and seeing good days. We're in ch chapter 3 now of First Peter. Is it possible to love life and see good days regardless of what others say about you or what others do to you? Let that question in. Is it possible to love life and see good days regardless of what others say about you or what others do to you? Not in our flesh. That's why we have got to be plugged into Jesus. That's why we have got to suffer like Jesus suffered. That's why Peter said, I want you to put aside, put aside all those hurtful, fleshly emotions and feelings and uh, be like Jesus. Now, he, in chapter 2, Peter painted with a really broad brush about everybody that you may come into contact with the church, at work, government. Now, in chapter 3, he zeroes in like a laser on the family relationship. And this is when it gets hard because oftentimes we treat perfect strangers better than we do our own family. And he says, look at the verse, first part of chapter 3, in the same way. What does he mean, in the same way? He says, in the same way as what I've told you in chapter 2, how you interact with each other, with government officials, now in that same way, I want to take those same principles and I want you to bring them to your house and put them in your living room. And he starts with wives. And he tells them, wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be one over to Christianity, to what you believe, without a word by the behavior of their wives. Now that's hard. Now there's some wonderful godly women in this church who I have such respect for because they have had to deal with the things that most women would have said, that's it, I'm leaving, here's your walking paper. But what he's saying is, be submissive. Now, he, he goes on to say to these women, I want your, your beauty, your adornment to be from your heart. I want it to reflect the love that you have in Jesus Christ. Now there, you know, he, he says, I want you to be chaste, and I want you to have respectful behavior. You know, we don't have any idea of what those words mean in our society anymore. We are just crude and um, just living. We are animals dressed in nicer clothes. Your adornment must not be merely external. He's saying it's not how you look on the outside. It's not how you dress. It's not how you do your hair. It's not jewelry. This isn't an opportunity to jump off in this verse and talk about what other uh, churches may believe about how women are to appear. But what Peter is saying is, it is your heart. You need to reflect the nature of Christ. Um, look at verse 7. Husbands, in the same way. The same way as what? The same way as he just talked to the women. The same way as he talked about to the church uh, in chapter 2 about here, here's how I want you to conduct yourself. But he says to the husbands, and, and I think this is very interesting, you husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. I think this is really interesting. His instruction to women is to be submissive, have a respectful Christ-like 
attitude. Respect your husband. So what? So that if you have a husband who is not a believer through your behavior, he will come to know the gospel. That's a remarkable thing. But the instruction to husbands is the, res the consequences are different. He says to the husbands, again, look at verse 7. Live with your wife in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. What? Why? So that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter is telling the men, you need to follow our behavior characteristics and, and follow the teachings of the scripture so that your prayer life, your relationship with your heavenly Father is good. Now, I know people think, oh, you know, Jeannie's going to go off on some feminist rag here, but, but I'm not. Uh, the younger Jeannie probably would have. What is going on in this church now, this great revival, is because men have stood up to say, I will live courageously for the sake of the gospel. I will be a Christian leader. And I thank God for this. That is why I believe we are seeing the growth. Does that mean that what the women did all those years didn't matter? Absolutely not. But you know, he tells us here, y'all are res to respect each other as fellow heirs. We are all the same in the eyes of Christ. He died for all of us. But we need to get back to the basics. We need to understand there are certain roles and with those roles are certain responsibilities. And men have been called to be godly leaders. And I thank God for the, the two guys in here tonight and for what we're seeing, the young men that we've got working in the back. This is a gift from God. This is grace. We are to respect that with each other. Now, how do you make it through suffering? You know, because we're all going to suffer. And um, I want you to look at look at um, chapter eight. I mean, verse eight of chapter three. He gives us a clue here. He says, "To sum it up, in conclusion, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic." Show brotherly love, have a tender heart, and a humble mind. If you have these five characteristics, unity of mind, harmonious, harmoniously coexisting, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and a humble mind, you're not going to have room for malice, deceit, hypocrisy, evil, and slander. That, that's just it in a nutshell. And when Peter says to sum it up, I, I would encourage you to mark your Bible because that's the key. We have to have unity of mind, and it's not my mind or Barry's mind or uh, Miss Juanita's mind. It is the mind of Christ. And if we have that, all of these other things will flow out of that because Christ showed sympathy, he showed love, he showed a tender heart and a humble mind. Again, if you look at the latter part of chapter 3, it again talks about Christ's suffering. Do you see these uh, cycles that we go through? The characteristics, the suffering of Christ. We suffer what our characteristics should be. So now, at the end of chapter 3, we're circling back around for a, a reminder of what Christ did for us. And if you look at um, <coughs> verse 18, of chapter 3. For Christ also died for sins once and for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. 
It is that sacrifice, that suffering, that brings us into the kingdom. And the example of Christ is his power he demonstrated at the resurrection. We have that same power in us. It's not anything we were born with physically, but it is a gift that we received of the Holy Spirit when we came to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. That is the power that will fuel us if we tune into it to be able to love life and see good days even when we are suffering. So, to sum it up, for the rest of the week, and again, this is easier to do with work, and it's even easier to do it here at the church, but I mean, he's saying you need to do this at home. And I want you to think about this. Unity of mind. This is a harmonious, uh, peaceful existence. Sympathy. Brotherly love. Tender hearts. Humble minds. You know what? Peter writes, you know, it's not a big deal if you suffer because you did something stupid, you know, or you did something wrong. But if you're called to suffer for doing what is right, make sure how you handle it, you glorify Christ in all that you do. With that said, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to be like you, but it's just so hard because we listen to the world and we listen to Satan. Father God, help us tune Satan out. Help us focus on the resurrection power. Help us realize we must submit to you, Father. And if we do not do that, if we do not surrender this faulty concept we have of our independence, that we are going to struggle. We need to follow you, Lord. And we want to follow you. And we just ask, Lord, that you strengthen us and help us, Father God, in all that we do reflect you so that those in authority over us, those we don't like, those that have done us wrong, Lord, that they will see us acting differently. And through how we respond to them, the gospel will be proclaimed. We ask all of this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our conqueror. Amen.